Hello everyone. Welcome to our Friday Forecasting Talks. Uh, today we are having two guests from one company. It's Chris Regan and Dmitry Shutin. And they will be talking about uh, predicting prices on the electricity market. But before they do that, I wanted to say a couple of words about the center who organizes this. By the way, my name is Ivan, if you don't know that. Uh, so let me provide a brief introduction to what the center does, what we do. So the first slide is uh, our team and very brief description of the services that we provide, uh, you see including courses on forecasting and uh, marketing analytics, including summer projects and um, research related activities. Uh, we have expertise in a variety of topics, including marketing analytics, demand forecasting, supply chain forecasting, and so on. And this is our team, uh, plus minus, so you can see all the bright faces that <laughs> work with us. Um, but today I also wanted to say a couple of words about one specific activity, one specific service that we provide. It's a master project, summer master project. I know that we have quite a lot of time before summer, but uh, it still makes sense to start thinking in advance. So that's why I decided to introduce this in November. So we run summer master projects, which can be useful for your specific company if you have uh, a very, very specific problem that you want to solve. Uh, and you need some sort of academic expertise, so you need uh, expertise of people who know more about that specific problem. And obviously we don't have uh, a lot of resources anyway, so you cannot spend your own resources on that, but maybe you, you can uh, outsource it, let's say, to a university. So that's what, uh, that's why it can be useful. Examples of what you can do would include uh, some sort of benchmarking to see if the process, processes that you have can be improved. For example, your team provides, produces forecasts uh, on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, and you're not sure if uh, what they use is accurate enough. You want to see whether it is or not. So that would be one of the potential projects. Um, students can also develop a procedure for something uh, either in R, in Python, or just uh, as a basic recommendation, what to do and what not to do. And this is done over summer and of May till August by a student. We have a brilliant cohort of students in the degree of uh, Masters of Bus Business Analytics, um, but they will be supervised by our team members. So it is a great opportunity to um, get something from academia. And this is totally free for you because uh, this is something that students need to do anyway, and this is beneficial for them. So it is free for your company. Uh, in the end of this master project, you will get a report explaining what students found. If you need, they can also provide a code that they used to develop whatever they developed. And in fact, what, whatever else you want from students uh, in reasonable uh, boundaries, let's say. So for example, typically they also produce the final presentation showing uh, the results to your team. So this is a very brief explanation of what uh, some master projects are and the topics uh, include but are not restricted with forecasting, inventory management, marketing research and analytics, pricing, optimization and others. If you are interested, so then please get in touch with us. You can either find us on Twitter or LinkedIn you can send us an email, visit our website. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel where we upload uh, videos from the Friday Forecasting Talks and other events. And if you're interested in Friday Forecasting Talks, please visit this page. You will see what we already had. So far we had uh, 16 talks in the previous year and uh, this will be the fifth talk this year. And we still plan to have six more in the year 2022. Right, so thanks for your attention. Now we can move to the presentation. Uh, Chris and Mitri, please, you can start sharing your screen. 
Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dimitri, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank those who are listening to this uh, session live. I know that the markets are pretty volatile today, especially with the uh, latest news of the new COVID variant coming from South Africa. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of uh, razzmatazz going on on the stock market. Commodities are holding up uh, better than the stock market, especially carbon, who seems to be pretty much relentless. But um, yeah, so really appreciate your time. Also, thanks to those who are going to watch this session in recording on YouTube. And um, uh, on that note, I think we uh, should probably start. We have a pretty packed agenda for today, so we'll keep it punchy. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how traders predict prices and liquidity in the electricity market. This slide is something that I'm legally obliged to show you, so it's an important disclaimer showing that this information is proprietary and confidential to Brady. And before we begin, I wanted to do a quick introduction of uh, a person who is sitting in front of me, who will take over the first half of the presentation, Chris Regan, Product Director at Brady. Uh, he manages all energy products within Brady portfolio, including development of a new short-term energy power product, PowerDesk. Uh, Chris has got over 20 years in the energy industry. He headed up uh, shift trading and curve trading uh, teams at EDF Energy, the largest energy company in the UK. Uh, he is also a chair and a board member in a number of uh, companies within the energy industry. Uh, on this note, I'm going to pass over to Chris. Thank you, Dimitri. And Dimitri is working as well with myself in Brady. He's our quantitative analyst and he leads the development of our advanced analytics module, which we named PowerDesk Edge. Dimitri's got over five years experience in the energy industry and before that he worked with me at EDF Energy, the UK's largest energy supplier, both as a trader on the curve desk where he managed long term trading of carbon and he also before that worked in the volume forecasting team where he's responsible for demand and non energy cost predictions. So lots of overlap with what we're talking about today. So thank you very much Dimitri for uh, inviting me along. Dimitri also keeps himself very busy and works late into the night every evening. So he tells me where he's studying for his uh, level one of the chartered financial analyst exam, which is taking a lot of his time. But congratulations on all that hard work and good luck. Thank you. That should be over in February. So shall we begin? Thank you. So myself and Dimitri both work at a company called Brady Technology. Brady Technology supplies um, solutions to companies to make sure that they can trade their positions in the commodities in the energy market. So we empower commodities and trading companies and energy companies to get their best value out of their positions. We have strong offerings in physical and financial energy, as well as risk management and credit risk management as well. A sample of our customers out there, these are some of the biggest and best of the energy trading market. We won't dwell on this, but we have a big footprint, mainly across Europe with strong presences, particularly in the GB and the Nordic markets. So my part of this presentation is to tell you what the old world was like before passing over to Dimitri, being the naturally older person in the presentation. So I'll tell you about yesterday before Dimitri goes in to the much more exciting today and tomorrow. Thank you, Chris. Before we begin, um, I have a tendency to refer to some certain terms um, as if everyone knows them. And we know that not energy, not everyone, sorry, on this presentation is from an energy background. So sometimes myself and Dimitri will talk about power. Power is the instantaneous delivery. So that is measured in megawatts. And so when you think about a power station, the output of a power station, a bit like its speed, is measured in megawatts. We will refer to this term quite often. But when you trade energy, you trade energy over a specific delivery period. In the GB, it's a half hour period. So when you are selling or you're buying energy, you are selling, if you did a 100 megawatt trade, you are selling 100 megawatts over half an hour, which is a 50 megawatt hour trade. So the price of energy is rated in pounds per megawatt hour. And we do all of this to ensure that the overall supply demand balance in the countries that we trade are the same, the same because if you don't, the frequency of the system as it's alternating current which is measured in Hertz, either speeds up or slows down. So as we go through our presentation, you will see at points we'll talk about megawatts, which is like speed, energy, which is like distance, 
frequency, which is the cadence of the system, and price will be in pounds per megawatt hour. So our simplified view of an old energy flow has power stations like the ones I used to operate, like coal power stations, gas combined cycle gas turbines or CCGTs or nuclear power stations, which are large scale generators. They would be measured in units like they would generate 500 megawatts, which is enough to run a town or a small city, and they would generate on the instructions of a trader. These power stations would flow energy into the grid, denoted by our middle point there, the transmission system, and then customers would connect to the grid through their homes or their businesses, and as they used power, it would draw energy off the system. And it used to be that there would be big companies with big businesses, there'd be factories, there'd be people at home who just used energy, and there'd be big power stations like coal power stations, I mentioned gas, nuclear, that just generated electricity. And that was the way of it until about five to 10 years ago. If, however, you were like myself and wanted to know more about energy, you might go to National Grid's future energy scenarios and see a rather busy graph in front of you. Energy is nothing like it was when I started trading in 2001. We now have electric vehicles. Did you know that electric vehicles can charge, but also when the price is very high, they can discharge back into the grid and make money. We have transportation that could move from using hydrocarbons to using hydrogen. Hydrogen production is predominantly from electrolysis, which is energy intensive, but also you can switch off hydrogen production when energy prices are high. We have generation predominantly from older power stations falling off very rapidly. We have periods of over months where there was no coal generation in the GB, but our generation has been replaced by non-dispatchable generation, such as wind farms or solar parks, which are putting power into the grid, but you just don't know when they're putting power into grid and what they're going to be doing in their output. So this graph, which I would urge you all to read sort of National Grid's future energy scenarios, is the way that your energy is going to work as we go through to the next decade. In terms of what me and Dimitri are going to talk about, I've shown you the physical flow of power, but the physical flow of power has nothing to do with the way power is traded financially. Now, the way I like to think about power trading is imagine the electricity system is like a big vat of water. Now, electricity is what I like to call a fungible commodity. And if I want to describe what fungibility is, it's a rather bespoke term, but a fungible asset is one where you don't mind what you get back as long as it's the same value. My example would be that if I was to give Dimitri five pounds today because he forgot his lunch money, tomorrow, if he gave me a different five pound note back, I would not be offended. It's not the same five pound note. However, if I was to take my baby to the nursery today and I dropped off baby Andreas in the morning, I want the same baby back tonight. I will not accept a completely different baby of the same size and weight. So Andreas is not a fungible asset, but the five pound note that I give to Dimitri is a fungible asset. Electricity is the way it's traded. It is fungible. At the moment, whether it comes from a wind farm, a solar or a nuclear, the electricity part of it is fully fungible in the physical system. This means that other ways are used to track whether it's a green origin or origin electron coming from your, your electricity or whether it's something from nuclear, which is why when you read some of the reports of some suppliers claiming to be 100% green, you do find out they only directly source sometimes only 5% of their energy directly from green sources and they use certificates to guarantee from other sources. And I don't believe the certificate system is as good as you would hope as a consumer. So imagine this big vat of water for an energy, which is fungible, generators top up the vat of water. When you use electricity, you take some out of the bottom, but it doesn't matter whether it comes from my power station or someone else's power station. It just means that for each half hour delivered period, my job as a trader is to make sure the volume that I've poured in from my power stations equals the volume my customers have taken out from the bottom or I've traded by enacting bilateral buys and sells out of my water. So for equilibrium in my half hour period, as long as my input equals my output, 
then I'm balanced and I'm able to risk manage my situation. So in a lot of the concepts myself and Dimitri are talking about, we are talking about balancing the megawatt hours delivered in the half hour of delivery for prompt trading. So good energy trading is about balancing risk and profitability. You balance your positions. You minimize your risk. Minimizing risk means if you knew that your power station had some issues and it might break, you might not sell all of it out straight away. You might only sell it out very late to make sure that it hasn't yet broken. And you want to make sure you trade profitably, which simply means I want to sell at a price higher than I buy at to make money. But great energy trading that Dimitri will take you through is both balancing, minimizing risk and profitability, but we call it extract alpha, getting that extra bit out of your systems through your forecasting and your machine learning, your IP. So all energy strategies boil down to essentially selling higher than you bought or buying lower than you sold. So very simply, I might inherit a position from my wind farm that's going to generate X megawatts. In this scenario, I want to sell my megawatts and above the market average. So I'm not buying and selling. So my profit is based on did I beat everyone else? If I was a speculative trader, I might buy some power and then sell it. And my profit is a different between the two. If, for example, however, I sold all of my wind power the day before and I thought there'd be 100 megawatts and it outturns is only 50, I've got to go in and I say, right, I'm going to buy 50 megawatts. And then if I buy it below the market average, I could make a profit or I could rate myself, did I buy it below what I sell, sold yesterday to see if I made a profit? And essentially, the strategies boil down to making sure that you get more profit than loss by the timing and the levels of your buying and selling. Now, despite only 5% of the volume of energy trading in the prompt, this is actually the most challenging and volatile period for traders because this is where everything's delivered and everything breaks. So I want to go back to a couple of days ago in the GB market. Now, if we think about the value of power being something sub 100 pounds a megawatt hour and the average demand in the electricity system being of something like 50 gigawatts over 24 hours, then in a day you might see something between 50 and 100 million pounds worth of power delivered from generation to customer. So the overall asset could be worth 100 million. Now, the most expensive balancing day ever occurred this week, where the cost of just managing that the generation turned up the same time as supply needed it, and the megawatt hours in each half hour were balanced, the cost to the system operator and hence overall to the customer was actually 60 million out of that 90 million for the day or on top of it. So it is very expensive to get it wrong in short term power. So finally, before I move on to Dimitri giving you the way that it should work, when I was young and I had hair, the way that I traded was very simple. I would look at my big power station and I'd know exactly how much it cost me to generate because I only had a few because they were really big. So say my coal generation cost me 45 pounds a megawatt hour, I'd know what to do. But then I would look to my competitors and I would look at their power stations and I would know what they cost to generate. That was my key advantage, know what they cost to generate. I would then look at the middle aged man in grid who looked a bit like me and sit and schedule all the plan and say, what is that man likely to do or woman more likely to do down in Wokingham to the system and who do they need? And once I know who they need and what their marginal costs were, if my coal power station costs 45 pounds to generate, I don't sell it at 45 pounds. I look to the person that the grid needs and if they cost £100 to generate, I price my power at £99.99 .99 because I know I can get away with that price because I'm undercutting what they need. And because there was big power stations and it was slow moving, I could do that with my memory, mental arithmetic and a thing called a spreadsheet. Now I move on to Dimitri who will show you what the future really means. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I think that was a, a brief introduction and a whistle stop tour on the um, how the energy market is structured. And it was important to highlight that because we acknowledge that some of the listeners in this webinar potentially may not be that familiar with the energy market. And therefore, it was important to uh, set out the scene 
uh, before we actually start talking about technical details. Uh, short term prompt energy trading is affected by C by seven key market components, as you can see in the slide, which includes prices, volume, liquidity, volatility, market depth, bid offer spread and trading window. Potentially there are probably even more. Uh, but these are the seven ones that I came up with when I was preparing for this presentation. We're going to be talking about prices and volume today. Uh, just to emphasize, this is a graph that I saw on LinkedIn a couple of days ago, which shows uh, five key commodities in the energy world, uh, crude oil, Dutch gas, German power, uh, carbon emissions and coal. And uh, it shows the year to date performance of uh, the prices of such assets. And you can see uh, for yourself how much uh, higher they are compared to where they were a year ago, uh, which emphasizes the importance of uh, really accurate and diligent trading. Uh, now, when it comes to short term energy trading challenges, uh, there are three challenges which I would like to highlight. But, but before I go on to them, let's look at this chart. This chart shows European Union carbon allowance certificate with December 21 delivery year to date. In this chart, you can see a typical candlestick uh, price pattern with uh, some technical indicators that I overlaid on top of the um, graph Bollinger Bands, simple moving averages, volume and moving average volume. Moving averages, conver convergence, divergence, volume of bands width, and relative strength index. These are some of the technical indicators that an analyst or chartist could use to devise price patterns. And div division of price patterns is possible in this case because the product is continuous and rollable. Therefore, it has got certain patterns based on human behavior. And since there is human behavior present here, those patterns are repetitive. And since they are repetitive, a trader could exploit uh, those opportunities to extract alpha on the market. However, what would you think if I told you that uh, there are uh, some really big important challenges associated with short term energy trading, which prevent an analyst from using uh, technical analysis to devise profitable trading strategies. Those challenges include discontinuity, non rollability and pseudo continuity. Discontinuity means that unlike in financial markets, short term energy products are not a continuous time series. Rather, there are 48 independent time series that are stuck in one. Uh, because there are 48 half hours and the uh, GB market is settled in half hourly levels. Non rollability means that unlike in financial markets, short term energy products cannot be rolled forward and have a fixed delivery date. For example, a certain product has to deliver between 12 and 1230 or 1 and 130. In the foreign exchange market, it's possible to do spot trading and forward trading where products can be uh, rolled forward, but it's impossible in the short term energy market. And so the continuity basically means that despite those two challenges, discontinuity and non rollability, some relationship within a time series still exists. Uh, this is a quick snippet of the uh, market in the, uh, of the industry dashboard that shows the system price, the market imbalance, the system demand and the generation by fuel type, uh, which I took from Alexo, which is the industry go uh, government body. And uh, this is effectively what traders are trying to predict in the prompt. They are trying to predict system demand and uh, predict prices, the risk of the prices and volatility of prices and also the system length. Uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, and since there may be some non energy related audience in this webinar, uh, uh, I think it's important to remind that uh, energy market in, in the UK is in GB settled at a half hourly level. So there are 48 periods within a day that are traded independently and they have fixed delivery time slots. For example, half hour one corresponds to midnight until half past midnight. Half hour 48 goes from half past 11 until midnight. So 48 periods that traders have to optimize at the same time. Now let's move on to the first challenge that I mentioned before, discontinuity. Short term electricity products should not be treated as a single continuous time series. Rather, they should be treated as 48 individual semi independent half hourly series. What I mean by that is that if you look at the chart on the left, you can see daily candles, open, high, low, close prices of uh, GB intraday prices, and there is a lack of trend. There is a lack of apparent trend. There is high intraday volatility and there are occasional extreme prices which uh, are significantly beyond three standard deviations from the mean. Those you can see here, yeah, like vertical spikes. Uh, they illustrate that volatility within a specific uh, product can be really, really high. Since this is a chart at the daily granularity for two years of data, uh, I zoomed in 
and I plotted half hourly open high low close intraday prices for just one week. One week starting from uh, 2nd of November 2020 until 8th of November 2020. And you can see basically the same. You can see lack of apparent trend in price, high intraday volatility, which is shown here. And also there are some repetitive volume patterns. You can see that there are repetitive volume patterns here. So maybe these are the patterns that we as quantitative analysts could exploit to um, beat, beat the market. So let's, let's find out if we can do that. Uh, the level of uh, price granularity that I showed in the previous slide is not the highest granularity. Trading happens on a second by second basis, and even each candle that I showed before can be further decomposed into more trades that occur under the hood. In this case, I'm showing all historical trades for, uh, uh, for Hafauli product 25 on 3rd of November, which starts delivery at 12 o'clock, finishes delivery at 12.30, and is corresponding gate, gate closure, where gate closure is the uh, fixed time, a cutoff, uh, beyond which trading is not allowed. In this case, let's walk, let's walk, let's go through this example. Trading opened at around 10:10, 10, 10, uh, 10 past 10, and the first trade was executed at 35 pounds per megawatt hour. Volume was very small, as you can see here in the middle chart. Then there was a period of some illiquidity where this product was not trading. Then there was some active trading here, and then after this point in time, which is roughly 10:45 price plummeted and price plummeted from 40 pounds per megawatt hour to around 20 pounds per megawatt hour. So it was more than a 50% decline. Just think about it. If you could see this on the financial market, on the stock market, 50% decline in a matter of 30 minutes is huge, is huge. You can probably see movements like this on crypto, uh, but not on the stock market. Uh, so price reached a low of about 20 pounds per megawatt hour and then it surged it started to go up again. So in fact, it closed for that period flat. It closed again at 35 pounds ish, open 35, closed at 35. But within that period, there was huge volatility and upward and downward movements. What we can also observe is that volume accelerated towards gate closure, which is reasonable because traders had to balance their positions. So three, three key conclusions that we can devise from this chart, significant intra half hour volatility, extended periods of illiquidity, and unpredictable acceleration or deceleration of trading towards gate closure. This is another example for half hour 36 on 9th of November, which delivers after uh, which delivers at 17:30. So this is peak time uh, because this is when uh, people return home. They start boiling their kettles, uh, preparing their food, um, so and start watching telly. So this is period of high demand. Equally, you can see this is depicted by the price. Price was very high, 125 pounds. And again, as we saw in the previous chart, it went up, it went down, and then it went up again, and then it closed flat. This illustrates that although open and close prices can be the same or similar, within that half hour, there can be so much action going on. And just imagine that a trader needs to optimize multiple half hours simultaneously, as is shown in this chart. In this chart, I just, I'm just showing five periods, not 48, not 24, just five. And you can see the price evolution and the patterns, how they are evolving at the same time. And just think of a poor trader who is sitting there on the prompt, having to optimize all of these periods simultaneously. This is crazy. And there is so much pressure and uh, uh, there is not even a chance to step away from the desk and uh, have a cup of tea or something, because anything can, ha can happen at any moment in time. And here we can see different trading windows, different price levels and different liquidity levels. All of these challenges uh, is something that the trader needs to bear in mind. And finally, pseudo continuity. We have just spoken about discontinuity and non rollability, but there is another one pseudo continuity. This chart here shows the ridges or distributions of multiple periods. We have 48 periods and we have distributions for each. And we can see that these distribution vary uh, in their um, skewness, so where they are positioned in the chart, and also their um, uh, wideness and narrowness we can conclude that intraday price is very significantly between half hours. For example, here uh, in half hours 35, 36, 37, average price is around 50 pounds per megawatt hour. That's 2019, 2020 I'm talking about, by the way. Now it, it is, it's going to be even higher. Um, and in other blocks, say block one and two, which are overnights, prices are significantly lower, 30, 35 pounds per megawatt hour. 
So yes, we can conclude that there are periods of high electricity demand and they have highest prices and highest variability, and there are periods of low electricity demand and they have lowest variability. We can decompose that series and deseasonalize it uh, and uh, basically plot every single uh, day uh, in the same graph to show if there is any seasonal pattern. And yes, indeed, there is a seasonal pattern. We can see that uh, the, the y-axis labeled here are unitless and they show that um, in pe periods of peak demand, half hours 35 to 40, prices tend to be higher than on average. And in periods of low demand, say half hours 1 to 10, which is all corresponds to overnights, uh, prices tend to be lower than on average. So that's another way of showing that there is a seasonal pattern within those prices. Finally, we can calculate if there is any relationship between uh, the time series and time series with itself. Uh, this is done by calculating autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation coefficients. The disadvantage of autocorrelation coefficient is that it propagates uh, correlation or spills it into adjacent half hours. Partial autocorrelation in this case is much better because it removes that effect. And in this example here, in the chart on the bottom, we can see that there is significant autocorrelation that actually exists only within two to six consecutive half hours, which means um, in, in plain English that a trader could potentially use uh, up to six half hours before uh, a period that they want to trade as a price indication or as a volume indication because they can safely say that there is some relationship uh, between consecutive half hours. What does it mean in terms of trading strategies? It means that, first of all, a trader can use multiple trading strategies based on those relationships, a pessimistic, a realistic and an optimistic strategy. A pessimistic strategy means that a trading strategy that fully discounts pseudo continuity and trades all half hours independently. It is agnostic of what is happening in adjacent half hours. This is probably the most true, um, true strategy because it assumes that there is no relationship and it just trades and predicts each half hour as a separate time series. A realistic strategy uh, assumes that there is some caution. It cautiously trades uh, and uses trade signals from leading half hours and gives the trader more time to react. For example, one hour or two hours to react. However, its prediction will be less accurate than prediction of the optimistic model. An optimistic model is something that uses uh, really close half hours. For example, I'm in half hour 24 and I want to predict half hour 26. Uh, that's the optimistic strategy. Uh, it will be using the nearest half hours to predict the consecutive periods. And on the final note, um, it is possible to deliver consistent PL against day ahead prices and against volume weighted average prices, provided a reliable forecast of price direction and expected volume. Uh, this is something that we at Brady do. We have our own uh, predict predictive algorithms that uh, forecast expected volume and expected price direction based on three different strategies I showed before, uh, pessimistic, realistic and optimistic. And with each of those, a uh, different level of PL can be achieved. Uh, I cannot disclose technical details here, uh, but in general, performance of the, such strategies can be monitored using uh, the training framework, using the watch or the algorithm monitoring tool, and also the metric which calculates PNL, provides risk assessment framework, and exports um, re reports for senior management and traders. On that note, I would like to thank um, everyone for listening to this and uh, Lancaster University for giving us uh, the floor today and uh, I think here th is the time when we can open the floor to questions. So thanks a lot that was an interesting presentation as I mentioned at some point I don't work in this area so I don't know much about it but uh, it is fascinating and uh, I've asked uh, Jethro Browell who is an expert in energy forecasting and uh, lecturer I guess even this is correct me if I'm wrong, Jethro, senior lecturer uh, in the University of Glasgow to provide some sort of uh, comment uh, for your presentation. So Jethro, over to you. Thanks Ivan and uh, thanks uh, Chris and Dimitri for a very interesting presentation. Um, yeah, where to start? I guess you, you, you teased us by telling us uh, with your title, telling us you tell us how to predict these things and You've maybe given us some hints, but uh, right at the end told us it was all a, a big secret, um, which I guess I understand uh, if that's a product you're selling, but um, maybe we can we can chat about uh, chat around that. 
So one thing I find fascinating about price forecasting in particular as a forecaster and a data scientist in general is dealing with some of the challenges you, you highlighted there around uh, the infrequent uh, and irregular arrival of data. So we see there with the, the really nice illustrations you showed of the intraday trade executions where uh, if you know we work often in academia we work with nice time series where you get an observation every half hour and you want to get some model to predict it but here in this world where you, you don't get an observation uh, uh, you know an expected time sometimes you get lots sometimes you don't get many and uh, I've seen plenty of plots like this where there are you know only a handful of, of executed trades for for a given period and that's that's a real a really interesting challenge I wonder if if that's maybe something to be willing to to talk a bit about and the other thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is um, forecast quality so you showed some um, really nice uh, PL plots there where you know, um, your trading algorithm is, um, is is turning a profit which which is fantastic however I guess in this sense in this case the there's more than just a, one forecast going on here right you probably you're probably forecasting several things at once and then you have a set of decision rules uh, to execute trades based on on those forecasts so uh, here I'm interested in uh, how important is forecast accuracy perhaps are the um, do you care how accurate the forecast is if it's making money for instance <laughs> uh, I think this is a really interesting aspect and something where uh, in the energy market you can you can you can accidentally make money right if you find yourself on the right side of the, the system accidentally Anyway, I, I talked a little bit. Maybe if Chris and Dimitri want to respond, then we can have a little discussion, and then I'm sure Ivan is collecting lots of questions in the chat as well, and we can pass over in, in five or ten minutes. So I'll, I'll jump in with some some simple backgrounds, and then Dimitri will give you some some more of the details. I think the, the thing to remember about the way we rate ourselves in energy trading is you rate yourself against the average of everyone, and so. For every trade, there is a buyer and there's a seller. So if the trade is above the market average, then there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser for the for the, buy, the counterpart. So what you can end up doing is if you rate yourself against the market average price, then you have a distribution of people who have beaten the market average price by a certain amount and an equal opposite value where it's been beaten. Okay, so you get win, you do get the winners and losers. So we're we're not looking to predict absolute market price because if you've got the greatest model in the world and you t it tells you the price is going to be 20 and everyone's trading at 15 that's what they're trading at 15. so dimitri's analysis looks at whether prices are going to go up or down the key thing is if i'm sitting on some power i need to sell really there's only two decisions should i sell it now or wait and so he's he's basically working out how long to wait and at what point to execute and that then gives us the rating of do we beat the average, which is the volume weighted of average, average of everything. So therefore, versus the kind of random number generator, he's kind of beaten it. And we, we basically say you, you could have a trading strategy where you trade a little bit every minute and you end up getting the average. And that's a very simple thing to do. And our aim is to beat that, but only by a few percent, because that actually can add up to millions in the year. And the other thing we think about is we don't want huge variance. So if we've got a huge variance, yet we're only beating the average by 2%, we'll go back to the averaging in, and that's the way we rate our quality. Over to Dimitri. Yeah, I think um, to answer your question, I would probably say that in forecasting practice in general, there are two possible approaches to predicting something, whether to predict, estimate as a point, say, I predict the price of £125, or estimate an interval. I think that price is likely to belong to that particular interval. I would say that point forecast, especially when it comes to price prediction, is very, 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 very hard, if not impossible. It's very hard to predict prices correctly, because if uh, if people could do that, uh, we probably would not be sitting there and, uh, you know, people, people would be millionaires. <laughs> um, so I think the way we approach this uh, particular forecasting problem is that we convert this into a binary outcome 
which is similar to a logistic regression, for example, and the binary outcome is uh, simply uh, put as whether my price is likely to go up or whether my price is likely to go down in relation to the open price. For example, here in this chart, my product half hour 36 opened at roughly 125 pounds per megawatt hour. It started trading at nine o'clock. I'm a trader sitting in front of my monitors on the trading desk. It is 11 o'clock. I know only the open price for this period. Yeah, this period delivers at 17.30. At nine o'clock, I still have uh, some time, some time before it delivers. And I can make a decision whether I think based on market fundamentals and technicals on that given day, my price is going to go up or my price is going to go down in relation to the open price. And based on that, I transact. That's how I would um, answer that question. And, and if I'm not sure, I might do a little bit. Yeah, just to reduce my risk. Yeah, I might do a little bit of legging in. Okay, uh, just do you have any anything else to add to discussion? Uh, maybe just a quick clarification. So you, you talked about um, trade now or, or wait. I guess the the ultimate wait is you know finishing our balance and taking whatever the imbalance price happens to be. Uh, is that a factor in in your in these strategies, or or do you always uh, aim to trade out? Yeah, uh, I can take this one. So the system price, the imbalance price that you are referring to, Jethro, is a very, very important concept uh, on the market. I'm just showing it here uh, on the Alexon BMRS screenshot. Um, I would say that it varies from a country to country. For example, in Germany, um, they, ha they are uh, legally obliged to balance and close out all of their positions before the gate closure. But the structure is a little bit different in GB when uh, some imbalance volume is allowed. Um, so yes, this is taken into account by the model uh, because depending on the outcome of the system length, whether the system is going to be long or short, this is going to ultimately influence the system price. And the trader needs to make a decision how much volume they want to close out uh, before gate closure and how much volume they can leave for the imbalance market. And so are you forecasting the imbalance price as well? I ask out of uh, my own kind of professional interest as uh, we've recently finished a project on this this topic. So I'm interested to hear what what's going on elsewhere. Yeah, uh, so within Brady, we do not forecast imbalance prices because there are some other uh, companies who we partner with who provide the functionality. Uh, what we do is that we forecast the uh, intraday uh, price which uh, mm -hmm. traders transact at. Can I, can I add the <clears throat> myself and Dimitri have both created imbalance price forecasters historically. I was actually involved in the move from dual cash out to single cash out mm -hmm. and increasing that when I was running the trading desk, I had a specific PL metric on my traders to use imbalance prices to make money. So we both were very good at mm -hmm. understanding it. But if everyone bought our software and had the same imbalance price predictor, it would be self-defeating. <laughs> yeah, so self therefore I haven't made any investment to create a generic predictor. Instead, I'd expect people to put their own predictions in. Yeah, and uh, in the end of the day, it's um, so I we were showing this graph, right? How much volume gets uh, traded before delivery, right? So if we consider the prompt, it's 5% of overall volume that is being traded in the prompt. And if we consider the balancing market or imbalance mm -hmm. market, it's probably not 0.5 or not 0.3 percent of total volume. So most of the trading actually happens beforehand. That's mm -hmm. why, yes, it's a really good marketing tool to say that, oh, the balancing price, imbalance price is reached uh, 4,000 pounds per megawatt hour, but the mm -hmm. volume impacted as a result of that price rise is not as big as what is happening on the curve or mm -hmm. within two weeks before delivery or even on the prompt. Yeah. Great, thanks very much. Maybe I can uh, take advantage of my uh, being invited to ask questions and ask one more from a, an academic perspective. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Do. So if, uh, do you have a, a wish list of capabilities you would like academia to produce for you? Uh, that could help you make better forecasts or better use of data in general uh, and 
if you do, what, what, would, what would be on it? Um, yeah, I can take this one. So when we're talking about forecasting and trading on the energy market, it is very different from the financial market. And trading on financial market has been well established. It has been there for years. There are plenty of solutions for algo trading and uh, for different trading strategies out there. Uh, however, uh, there is a large discrepancy between energy trading and trading in the financial world. In financial financial markets, you have all those metrics such as Sharpe ratio, Sortino ratio, Calma ratio that allow you to assess your risk performance, how well you are performing versus the risk of the asset. For example, U.S. Treasury bill, right? Uh, you can estimate how how much alpha you are gaining from your strategy versus the risk-free investment however in the energy market nothing like this exists but i think actually it would be a really good addition to the market and the concept in general if there was a risk metric other than value at risk or uh, some net open position exposure but a risk metric that would take a risk-free energy investment and calculate performance of a specific trading strategy versus that risk-free investment. So that's something that, that is currently missing from, uh, from the energy, energy industry, unfortunately. Thanks, that's a great suggestion. Chris, did you have anything? Um, unfortunately, I was going to say what Dimitri said, that uh, I've just set in the task of seeing if he can create an alternative measure I think to, to add to what Dimitri said is um, when when we see customers using our algo strategies and our algo watches, that they're, they're not going to be spending months refining an algorithm. They're going to, I'm going to expect them to have a library of five or six different algorithms that have different risk appetites. We'll have ones that will likely to leg in when there's a low level of confidence in the interval, and ones that are happy to wait until the end of their predicted liquidity window. So we we need that simple metric understand how well they're doing not not because we want to look at it for hours and hours but we want to rate our algos performance on the fly and so i i predict to do that the the trader of the future would not be the trader like i was in the past the trader of the future will be someone with a, a data science or a, a quant background who will be using these techniques like these alternative sharp ratios to rate their algos to trade and i, I always say the old trader used to press a button to click or to trade, you know, no more click to trade anymore. Instead, I liken it from the move from the normal checkout counter to the self service that the trader used to be the person who was scanning your shopper, shopping. Now the trader will be the person watching the ten tills of everyone scanning their own shopping. And it'll be quite a different skill set out there. And to be able to assess the performance of ten simultaneous algos is going to be quite a skill set, which is why myself and Dimitri have created Bot Watch to be able to do that, but the academic input into how to rate them would be quite interesting. Yeah. Great, thanks very much. Uh, I should hand back over to Ivan to take some questions from the floor, I think. But thanks, thanks, Chris and Dimitri. Thank you, Jethro. Thanks Jeff. a lot, lot Jethro, uh, for interesting comments and discussions. So now we move to the questions and we already have a lot, to be honest. Um, I want to follow uh, the, the list of questions as they appear, I will collect them based on my judgment. Uh, so the first one, how efficient is the short term energy market actually? What, what can you comment on that? Well, the, the short term energy market efficiency, I don't, I don't know how you'd, you'd rate efficiency. Um, everything has to balance and it always does. So the, the market, if there is if there's too much power in the system, what happens is the frequency increases and then natural grid takes action. So the, the market doesn't have inefficiencies in the way that there's there's like missing money or there's there's a there's a difference between the overall generation and consumption because it goes into the kinetic energy of the system, which comes back out. So it's, it, to me, it's 100 percent efficient because everything flows from generator to consumer, just not financially efficient in terms of liquidity. Um, in the short term, it is hugely liquid. Um, what you'll find is there is no measure that anyone agrees on, because if you're a large company with both generation and consumption, then you think the market is efficient because you can use both sides. And if you're a small player who doesn't feel they're getting a good deal, you can play the market's inefficient. And unfortunately, rather than science, it's mostly decided on politics. So mm. I work in larger industry, so the market is efficient. 
<laughs> Dimitri, do you have anything to add to this? No, nothing to add. Shall we okay. go on, even though there is a list of questions? <laughs> yes, uh, the related question is, uh, there is extensive academic research that technical analysis is largely luck and often used by advocates to confuse others. It's a bit provocative question, I would say. Uh, so how come you claim to use it effectively? What's so special? Yeah, yeah personally, I'm a big fan of technical analysis and uh, um, the founder of technical analysis, Mr. Dow, who created the Dow Jones Index, uh, probably agrees with me or other way around. I agree with uh, him. Um, I think that uh, technical analysis uh, has a place uh, to stay in the market, especially given that it is based on human behavior and human behavior is repetitive. Yeah, we tend to forget things, we tend to remember things and we tend to do it with certain frequencies. And there is, there is always a behavioral component to trading a particular asset. For example, today there is a huge sell off happening on the US uh, and the European and Asian markets based on the uh, fear of uh, the new COVID uh, variant. Um, but the same thing happened uh, a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and um, I mean, pe people tend to repeat themselves and I think those repetitions is something that gives grounds to technical analysis. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as I said before, in the energy, in the short term energy trading, it is very, very hard to apply because of discontinuity and non rollability. But on the curve, it is easier to apply. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to predict uh, in advance when uh, repetition will happen actually? Well, if you look at this chart here, this is European Union carbon allowance. This to me looks like a double bottom this button here and if you look at the same uh, I can give you a ticker it's EUA uh, exclamation mark one I think if I'm not mistaken uh, you will see that today it's trading at over 70 euros and here it was trading at 60. So this is a double bottom pattern that <laughs> um, predicted the price to be significantly higher. Okay based on our sample size of one it does work. <laughs> <laughs> okay good. Um, do you use actually meteorological forecasts in your analysis? So meteoro meteorological forecast is extremely, extremely important on the curve. On the prompt market, it is probably less significant because it has a, it is already factored in the price. Yeah, so short term price deviations uh, should already account for uh, meteorological uh, anomalies. Yeah. So we, we go we go straight to the, the market price, which is factored in number of factors, including the wind for the wind farms, the solar for the solar farms. And of course, temperature effects, heating effects as well, much more dominant in gas than power. So rather than using that as one input, we use the output of price to trade. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Um, are you just looking at trends in the spot market prices and how does the that relate to the underlying imbalance volume in prices? I can jump in there. So um, National Grid sit in Wokingham and they have the job of balancing the system when people can't balance themselves. So they look at the overall demand and generation. And if someone has said they're going to generate and then they break down, they are allowed to schedule people in the last half hour to generate more electricity and they pay them a price that is usually a premium. So National Grid use a thing called the balancing mechanism with preset prices that people are offered in to offer short term flexibility. The level of imbalance that you get determines how much activity National Grid have to do. So as they move up the stack, that determines the price that they have to pay, and then that creates the cash out price. The role of the trader in the short term markets is to be able to get a good price versus imbalance. So every trader out there using the short term continuous markets is actually looking at the arbitrage between continuous and imbalance price to work out if it's a good trade. So therefore the market, the continuous market, the wholesale market trading tends towards the main prediction of where cash out is as you approach delivery, cash out being the imbalance price. Okay, I think we have a question from John, so over to you. Yeah, hi, um, I was just interested to know, we're talking about how well you can predict repeatable patterns. To what extent can you predict the volatility itself? Because that's going to be an important part of your interval forecasts. Yeah. Yeah, volatility is extremely hard to predict. We have um, a couple of models that predict both price direction and expected uh, volume. Uh, so volatility is something that we are also uh, looking at. I would say that 
yeah, just generally speaking, it is quite hard to predict. Predicting, predicting volume and predicting price is much easier than predicting volatility. So, so, so to add to that, one of one of the correlations we were successful on is um, the gradient of electricity demand. True. Does have a link to volatility because um, so in the morning between about six a.m. and eight a.m., the actual gradient of mm. megawatts required is very high. So therefore, the effect of being slightly out on time of starting up your power station or slightly out of of um, time on your forecast of when things are going to come on has a much bigger effect in the area you get in megawatts because of the high gradient and it's around the periods of high 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 gradient that we see more more volatility yeah so i was showing it here in the chart where you can see a ramp up in the morning when people wake up business is open and also a deceleration in the evening um, so yeah, we, we use some technical, well, not technical, but we use some metrics such as rolling averages and distances from those rolling averages to illustrate the gradient ascent and the gradient descent. And we use them as predictive variables. Yes. And, and volatility is ultimately caused by uh, traders and forecasters getting it wrong. It's around those periods that the error is greatest. Mm, okay. Right, thanks. Uh, so next question. Mm. Do we need to take into account fundamental data or is technical analysis uh, enough? We do a lot more fundamental than yeah. technical in the prompt. Yeah. So, uh, okay, you do a lot of uh, fundamental. Maybe you can uh, provide. Ah, yeah, here it is. Uh, what do you think about the role of human traders in this aspect? Um, I've recently That's written an article about it, so um, for those who are interested can add me on LinkedIn and uh, go and have a read. But basically, the idea is that there is much more uh, volume churn happening in continental Europe, for example, in Germany versus uh, the Nordic market or the GB market. Uh, to give some uh, fundamental for comparison, in, in Germany, they churn volume 15 times per year. So basically, they trade annual volume 15 times. Uh, in one year. Uh, in GB, the coefficient is only four. So traders churn volume four times. We think that this is likely to change in the future and the churn is going to accelerate. And if the churn is going to accelerate, it means that traders will have to optimize all these periods simultaneously. And a human being simply does not have enough attention span to look at all of these periods together and make reliable decisions all of the time simply because we get tired and that's that paves the way for algorithmic trading and automated trading which are not going to replace human traders completely but our vision is to help human traders make better decisions by leveraging algorithms if, if i could add to that my, my view of short-term power trading and the role of the human trader is they continue like dimitri said but you don't want to be the only person using an algo in a bunch of human traders because it's not going to work because they don't op opt rationally. But you definitely don't want to be the only human where everyone else is trading with algos. OK, uh, I will rephrase one of the questions that we have. Um, the question was related to uh, 2008 uh, no repetitions. Do you see, uh, are there any black swans in the electricity market? And if yes, what can you do with them? I think COVID was a black swan, definitely, uh, because when COVID happened last year, uh, so beginning of March, I think end of March-ish, um, demand uh, for electricity plummeted. Uh, so because everything was in lockdown, I think national demand decreased about up to 20%, and that caused a lot of um, stress and pressure, for, especially for energy supplies, who, had, who found themselves sitting on excessive demand. They, that they had to sell back to the market. As a result of this, they all started selling this back to the market and that put significant pressure on prices. So prices fell. At the same time, uh, it was just a few coincidences that there was too much wind and too much solar generation. So suddenly there was abundant, abundance of generated electricity, but no one needed it. As a result of this, prices remained very, very low for the summer 2020, for summer 2020. But then when Pfizer uh, made an announcement in November last year that they uh, developed their vaccine, uh, prices spiked. 
Yeah, so demand for electricity started to accelerate because everyone suddenly realized that uh, there was uh, some light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would add to that. Um, people have seen in the news recently that there's a lot of small suppliers going going under and they might think that's almost a black swan of the market. It's not. It's actually a failure of the way that the business model works. So most small suppliers are, are basically incentivized by the way the trading works not to hedge their position fully because of the expense of it. And so a lot of them exist purely because there's a good one way bet. The prices are likely to fall and therefore they'll make a big profit. But actually prices have gone quite differently. And so it isn't a black swan that's calling all of those failures. It's just an overlap of strategies caused by the way the regulator works and the way the market works and the way that credit and lending works. Yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, we're running out of time, so I will ask uh, probably the last uh, question. What are the long term trends for participation in the intraday market? Specifically, are traders finding the balancing mechanism in the UK more interesting market to trade in given the liquidity and volatility? So my, my view is that traders would have used imbalance to make money over BM. Historically, the BM is now um, getting more active, but the BM is dependent on the grid being active in taking people and um, essentially automation at National Grid has gone slowly. They've had some terrible projects that delivered badly, but if National Grid automated and it got down to micro assets, the BM, is a better way of, of managing. I think the prediction of power trading across Europe will be that smaller outfits will get into power trading because the barrier to entry will fall and people will buy products like myself and Dimitri's power desk to be able to trade quicker and cheaper rather than having to be a large trading house to enter the market. OK, right, so we need to finish, but there is one comment that I, I really, really want to ask. Uh, and, and uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't ask all of them. Please get in touch with Chris and Dimitri on LinkedIn. I'm sure that they will answer all the additional questions. So this comment is the following. Uh, will all power companies in UK become bankrupt? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. So, so they won't. Um, only, only ones that were set up as small suppliers hoping that price would fall with under collateralized positions and low expectations of profit. So it's due to the one way bet and, and put simply it costs money to trade. So therefore small suppliers haven't bought as much power as they needed because it was too expensive with a view that if prices went down, they've made a bumper profit. The small supply company would be bought out and the owner and the originator of it would make a huge profit because of that one way bet. We see lots of people going bankrupt. Yeah, and uh, in fact, uh, Chris and I have spent uh, about uh, half an hour talking about the process of supply of last resort recently in our podcast called um, Energy in Balance. So if you want, you can uh, uh, find the latest episode where we discuss this specific uh, matter in, uh, in detail. Right, thanks a lot. Maybe we can share the link to this uh, over LinkedIn. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the presentation. Thanks for answering questions. Thanks all the listeners for asking you, questions. Sir. And thank you very much uh, to Jethro, to Chris and to Dmitri. Thank you. Great. Have a good day and see you all in two weeks.